Hello! In this video, we will be looking at the different amino acids, zooming into their structures that give them different properties and functions. We will discuss them by grouping them according to similarities in their structures, making it easier for us to remember all 20 of them and their properties. I am Doc Bao and I am a retired biochemistry teacher of 25 years. Okay, let's start. It is always best to start discussions on amino acid chemistry by looking into their general structure. So amino acid chemistry, why are they termed amino acid? Because they're the amino group of your carboxylic acid. So sometimes they are called your 2-amino carboxylate. This is your alpha carbon that is the central atom in your amino acid. And just like your hand, this is chiral. No? Chiral comes from the Greek word kairos, meaning hand. Because you have different fingers, right? You don't, you don't have two thumbs. So just the same way, your alpha carbon in your amino acid, they are connected to four different substituents. So all of your amino acids except for one will have four different substituents. So all amino acids will have your carboxylate group. Now we'll look at this later on. Carboxylate or carboxylic acid. Sometimes they are written as COOH in their unionized form. Then you have your amino group or your NH3 positive if they're ionized or sometimes it's just NH2. Now we'll look at that later on. And your hydrogen. So all your amino acids will have these three. Your hydrogen, your carboxylate or your carboxylic acid group, and your amino group. And they are attached to your alpha carbon. Is alpha carbon your carbon 1? Remember this. Your alpha carbon is carbon 2. It is always your carboxylate carbon that is carbon 1. So later on when we're going to count the positions of your substituents, we should always remember that. The alpha carbon is the carbon that is attached to your carboxyl carbon. And we have something that gives uniqueness to your amino acids. And this is your R or this is your side chain. So your R group or sometimes known as your side chain, they will confer uniqueness in the structure of your amino acids. And consequently, it will confer uniqueness in their property and in their bonding no? or in their reaction intramolecularly or intermolecularly with, with other molecules. Since we're dealing with acids, from the term acids, no, amino acids, I think we cannot escape studying this concept. Your bronsted lorry concept of acids and bases. So you know your Lewis, you know your bronsted lorry. But sometimes they're simply called as bronsted acid. So what is a bronsted acid? A bronsted acid is basically what? What is being exchanged or what is being given away by a bronsted acid? A bronsted acid will just give away a hydrogen ion. And a bronsted base, on the other hand, is an acceptor of hydrogen ion. So, what is a hydrogen ion? We know very well that a hydrogen atom is you have a proton and an electron, right? That is the simplest of your atoms, right? That's, that's, that's your atomic number one. However, if it is a hydrogen ion, basically what is that? A hydrogen ion is just a proton. So a bronsted acid is something that will give away or that can donate a proton that is a bronsted acid. So a bronsted acid is a moiety that gives off that can donate a hydrogen ion. On the other hand, a bronsted base is something that can accept. So if we're going to look at the amino acid, which of the following is the bronsted acid? No, The bronsted acid here is your carboxyl group, right? So if we're going to look at this, your COH, that's your carboxylic acid. However, if it gives away its hydrogen ion, which is positive, it's a cation, it's a proton, it becomes your carboxylate. Take note of your semantics. If it is carboxylic acid, it still have your hydrogen. But if it is your carboxylate, it's in the ionic form. So that is your bronsed acid. So if for your amino acid, the bronsed acid is your carboxyl group. So if it donates hydrogen ion, which is a proton, which is a cation, it becomes negatively charged. So if you're asked a question, now which of the following amino acids will have a negative charge? Once it is ionized, so I always think of an acid because it gives off hydrogen ion. On the other hand, in the same vein, what is a bronsted base? That's why your amino group is also known as your basic group or your bronsted base because it can accept a hydrogen ion, then it becomes your your ammonium. No? So if we're going to look at this, it's a diprotic amino acid. In other words, it has only two functional groups. All amino acids have at least two functional groups. In this case, that's your carboxy group and your amino group. Now we can see that this has donated the hydrogen ion, so your carboxylate is the bronsed acid. 
Once it donates a hydrogen ion or a, a proton, it becomes your carboxylate. On the other hand, your amino group, this is your bronze base. Once it accepts a proton or hydrogen ion, it becomes your ammonium, it's positive. So in this case, this is your cationic species. This is your anionic species. In the middle, no, in most amino acids, disregarding the R group, at physiologic pH, no, 7.4, all amino acids will exist in a dipolar, in the doubly charged moiety, but with a charge of zero. So it has positive one and it's negative one, but the overall charge is zero. And you call this your sweeter ion. So you have your cationic species, you have your anionic species, and you have your sweeter ionic. We'll be discussing this in a later live stream, ionic properties, okay, which is really more complicated. But this is just an introduction. Since your alpha carbon is a chiral carbon, it's like a hand, four different substituents, you can have in anchomeric form. Fissure projection is not only for carbohydrates, it is for amino acids as well. The carbohydrates exist in your L and your D enantiomeric. Forms, right? In your amino acids, the same. They are enantiomers. You have your L amino acid and you have your D amino acid. For carbohydrates, what is our reference? So, how do we know if a monosaccharide is a D or an L enantiomer? Usually, we look at the hydroxyl group that is attached to your penultimate chiral carbon. But in amino acids, basically similar, but please remember that the most oxidized group, carboxylate group, should be pointing upward. So once it is pointing upwards, we now look into the orientation of the amino group. If the amino group is oriented not to the left, this is your L amino acid. Consequently, if the amino group is oriented to the right of the carbon, that is your D. If you can see, it's, it's inverted, right? It's flipped. It's really, theoretically, a mirror image. But if you rotate this, if you rotate the L amino and try to superimpose it to the D amino, it will not jive. It will not superimpose. They're done superimposable, just like your carbohydrates. Amino acids are present in which enantiomeric forms? In nature, L or D? It's the opposite of your carbohydrates. But amino acids, it is your L. How many standard amino acids do we have? By standard, meaning uh, they are translated huh, by the genetic code. You have your codon, you have your triplet. You have a codon that will code for this. So they are translated. So I know we have hundreds of amino acids, but we have only how many standard amino acids? So just remember how many toes and how many fingers you have. I know some of you, you know there's a 21st and there's 22nd. As far as I know, I look this up, you still have 20, okay? So we can assign one set of amino acids per, per group of fingers, okay? So we'll go to this one by one later on. So first is you have five, okay? We'll show what is common to, to all five. These are your aliphatic, non-polar amino acid. To remind everyone, aliphatic means you don't have any cyclic structures, any aromatic rings. And later on, we will see are not heteroatoms, so they don't have any oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen. It is just carbon and hydrogen. So that is the first group. The next is aromatic. We look at the structure so that we can remember it more easily. Aromatic are the cyclic structure. Most of them, they have the, the benzene ring or the phenyl ring. So the next group is serine and tri treonine. We'll see this later on. They have a similar functional group. Then cysteine and methionine. What is common with cysteine and methionine? They contain a sulfur atom. Okay, They have a sulfur atom. And you know very well, no, aspartic acid and glutamic acid these are your acidic amino acids and you have your amides, your asparagine and glutamine. If you have acidic amino acids, you have your basic amino acid. This might be controversial. Most books will give this three. Histidine, arginine, and lysine are your basic amino acids. And you know very well what basic means. They have a nitrogen that can accept a hydrogen ion in their R group. But acidic, they have an additional carboxyl group that can donate a proton. And what's the last? Very special amino acid because it is not an alpha amino acid. It is an amino acid. It is proline. Okay, 21 and 22, this is the latest. Again, to define a standard amino acid is an amino acid that is translated from a genetic code. You don't need any post-translational modification. I'm sure you have heard of hydroxylacine and hydroxyproline, right? Hydroxylacine and hydroxyproline are in college, they are modified after being translated, after being synthesized in the ribosomes. 
However, for selenocysteine, no, it's like cysteine instead of sulfur, you have selenium. Okay, and your amino acid pyrolysine. This looks like lysine. We will look at lysine later on, but it is a pyrrol ring. That's of 21st and 22nd. Very, very rarely, they will be translated your first hand. Here you have five. What do we mean by aliphatic? Aliphatic means you don't have any cyclic structure. By the way, what's special with glycine? 19 of the 20 amino acids have four different substituents. But in glycine, what is the R group in glycine? The R group in glycine is H. So what is conferred to glycine? What can we say about glycine? Glycine has no chiral carbon. So it has no L or D enantiomeric form. So if it's glycine, it will, it will just be mentioned as glycine. And what did we say again about aliphatic? Why are they nonpolar? They are nonpolar because you don't have any heteroatoms. You don't have any oxygen. You don't have any nitrogen. You don't have any sulfur. So you have only carbon and hydrogen. What can we say about the electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen? Electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is they're almost the same. Electronegativity is the degree of attraction for the electrons. So in this case, the electrons are shared. They are nonpolar. The hydrogen here cannot participate in hydrogen bonding. So aliphatic, they are all nonpolar because the R groups are composed only of your carbon and hydrogen. If it's only composed of carbon and hydrogen, the electrons are shared equally. If there's a question, the aliphatic nonpolar amino acids in a globular protein will locate themselves inside on the inner or exposed to water. So they're aliphatic, they're nonpolar, they are hydrophobic. So they will be found inside within the molecule. The valine and leucine, what is special among the three is they are branching. So you learn in biochemistry, if a structure is branched, they are harder to synthesize. So that will give you a clue. Ah, this is a branch chain amino acid. This is harder to synthesize. So they are essential. They are needed in the diet. Otherwise, you'll be deficient because your body cannot synthesize such. That's already five. Glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine. They're nonpolar aliphatic. I think this is a lot better than memorizing the mnemonics because it's just ultra short-term memory. For me, that's not the way. Aromatic, basically, you have a benzene ring. From organic chemistry, you know very well that your electrons here are delocalized, not they're shared equally among the carbon. So sometimes we don't put the lines anymore, you just put a circle. Since the electrons are shared equally, this is really hydrophobic. Phenylalanine is one of the most hydrophobic amino acids. So phenylalanine is nonpolar. Aromatic rings will only have some degree of polarity based on their substituents, as you can see here. If the substituents have nitrogen, or oxygen like tyrosine, then they will become polar. Tyrosine is just a hydroxylated phenylalanine. In, in the body, we can easily hydroxylate your phenylalanine. So tyrosine is non-essential. You can easily hydroxylate your phenylalanine to tyrosine. Take note of the one-letter names. Tryptophan, what is the one-letter name for tryptophan? It's W. No? As I mentioned, it is the only amino acid that has a double ring. That's a good tip. So it has a double ring. And this is the indole. You're not seeing any substituents that can ionize. Tryptophan is nonpolar as well. Tryptophan, this is a hard amino acid to, to synthesize. Anyway, we have a mnemonic. The only mnemonic that I'm going to use for your essential amino acid. So... For the asterisk, please take note. At least do remember, I, I'll ask you to remember seven amino acids that really have to be remembered. Tyrosine, what is the functional group that can ionize is your phenyl hydroxyl. So in this case, you don't only have two functional groups. You, know, you have your carboxyl group, you have your amino group, but you have a third functional group. So you have trifunctional amino acids. So later on, when we go to the polarity, you know, when we classify them, if they are neutral, acid, or base, Take note, tyrosine is acidic, slightly acidic. Serine and treonine, what is common? Your serine and treonine are hydroxyl containing. They are the hydroxyl containing amino acid. So as such, they are hydroxyl. They don't have any aromatic rings, so they're aliphatic, but they are polar. But they are uncharged. Which moieties will give a charge group? Once they ionize, these are your acids and bases. Acidic amino acids and basic amino acids. So these are your your renin, your treonine, so they are polar, but they are uncharged. They are neutral, but they are polar. 
because later on we will see that amino acids are grouped into acidic, basic, neutral. But neutral does not mean they're always nonpolar. Neutral can also be polar and nonpolar. Threonine, what do we see in threonine? It's a branch. It's a branch chain. So sometimes you might be asked which of the following is a branch chain and you don't see valine, leucine, and isoleucine, but you see threonine. Some books will classify threonine as branch chain. Then your sulfur containing, so 11 and 12, cysteine and methionine, they contain sulfur. Cysteine, you have a sulfidryl group, you have an asterisk. So please do remember this. This is another trifunctional amino acid. It has a third functional group. And what do you call this? This is your sulfidryl group. That is your sulfidryl group. But in this case, no sulfur, we know very well, it's a highly electronegative atom. So the electrons are mostly grabbed by sulfur. So hydrogen can go away, can be donated. So cysteine is classified as acidic. Okay, cysteine, so if you remember the structure, I know it will take some effort. You look into the structure and you will remember more easily. If you're getting some value, you might consider subscribing or liking this video as well. Methionine. Sulfur is electronegative, but it has already been shielded by the methyl. I think this is your thiol S ether. So your methionine is nonpolar. Okay, so you have only two sulfur containing amino acids, but you can see that they are worlds apart. Methionine is nonpolar. It's bulky, it's hydrophobic, it is essential. Now, this is hard to synthesize, impossible to synthesize. However, cysteine is weakly acidic. It means that it is polar, but it can be synthesized from the body. Actually, when you synthesize cysteine from lysine, you need the sulfur that will be donated by or that will be sourced from methionine. So now acidic is what do we mean by acidic? We have an additional carboxyl group that can donate a hydrogen. If this is alpha carbon, what do you call this carbon? If we're going to count by using numbers, this is carbon 1. The carboxylate carbon is always carbon 1. Please do remember that this is carbon 1, this is carbon 2 is carbon 3 but sometimes when you give the scientific name if you're asked what is the third functional group of aspartic acid so this is alpha this is your beta this is your beta carboxyl that is your beta carboxyl or one two three or three carboxyl on the other hand glutamic acid or glutamate no glutamate glutamate it, this is aspartic 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 acid okay this is glutamate glutamate that is letter e what is the third functional group? This is alpha carbon, beta carbon. Okay, alpha, beta, gamma. So this is your gamma carboxyl. So they are highly acidic and both non-essential. They can easily be synthesized in the body. So after that, what is the next? We'll just take the amide. This can be amidated. So your aspartic acid becomes aspalagin. So this is your amide. What can we say with amide? So nitrogen is highly electronegative. The hydrogen here can participate in hydrogen bonding so your asparagine and glutamine are neutral they don't ionize but they are polar i'm just giving the basis so if you have an amide this is an amide of aspartic acid and this is amide of your glutamic acid they are polar but they don't ionize they are neutral okay please do remember the one letter name so you have only four if you have acidic amino acids what are these three Histidine, arginine, and lysine has an additional amino group that can accept a proton or that can accept a hydrogen ion. So these are your basic amino acids. Basic amino acids, they accept a hydrogen ion, they accept a cation, becoming positively charged. So this is arginine R. What is the R group? Please do remember. Arginine has some special peculiarities. Okay, so I'll tell you now. Arginine is the most basic amino acid. Now, when we're going to discuss your ionic properties of amino acid, the R group of arginine, your guanidinium group, will have the highest pKa. In the, in the next live stream, we'll be discussing the titration of your amino acid. So it's your guanidinium. Please do remember, there are only seven. Please remember the additional functional groups of seven amino acids. Okay, only seven. Then the 13 will tell you that they are neutral. That is K, okay, that is K. What is the functional group? Let's count. This is alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. The amino group is attached 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's 6 amino, okay, 6 amino or epsilon amino. So this is the 6 trifunctional amino acid. And histidine can be protonated, okay, this can be protonated and we know very well that nitrogen can only have 3 bonds, right? So this can become positive. What, what do you call this group? 
what is the functional group of histidine? Functional group of histidine is what is? So we have 19 of the 20, and the last is proline. Proline is special no, because the R group of proline is joined to your alpha amino. So you have a pyrolidone. So this is an amino acid. As can be seen here, proline is also classified as aliphatic, nonpolar, and non-essential. Because of its size and structure, proline serves special purposes in protein structure and function. So this concludes our discussion on the structure of standard amino acids. This is the edited version from our live stream discussion on the structure, nomenclature, and classification of amino acids. Thank you very much for watching. If you find value in this video, kindly click the like button, subscribe, and click the notification bell to be notified of our latest video uploads.